All right. Welcome everyone to the March edition of the 2021 A20 Sustainability Forums. Uh, my name is Zach Waz Smith. I'm a community engagement specialist in the Office of Sustainability. And I am happy to be joined tonight by a wonderful panel uh, who is going to help us explore the ins and outs of waste and waste reduction and the circular economy and what that means for Ann Arbor and how we can achieve carbon neutrality by 2030. Um, so with us tonight are, uh, we, we have Jenny Petoskey, who is the Solid Waste Outreach and Compliance Specialist for the City of Ann Arbor. Uh, we have Matt Nod, who uh, is joining us from next cycle. He's got a vast history uh, in Ann Arbor. And Bryant Weinert, who is the Director of Strategy and Recycle at Recycle Ann Arbor. Forgive me. Um, so the way tonight will work is um, we're going to hear from each of our panelists on a different topic. Um, after their presentations conclude, we'll open the floor for Q&A. Tonight's event is being recorded, so if you miss a part, a portion of the presentations tonight, you'll be able to find those on our website at a2gov.org slash sustainability. You have a couple of ways of submitting questions. We have the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You're welcome to submit questions there. You are also um, able to raise your hand, and if you would like to um, ask your question live, you can raise your hand and I can unmute you. Um, we'll, you can submit questions at any time during tonight's presentations. Um, most will be fielded towards the end, but we'll just keep you in order as we get to them. Um, so I just want to thank you all again for joining. Um, and without further ado, let's get into it, shall we? So up first, ladies and gentlemen, uh, is Jenny Petoskey. Um, she has been with the city for almost three years doing outreach and compliance specialist for, uh, for the city. She recently co-authored a paper with the Office of Sustainability and Innovations on the circular economy in Ann Arbor, which uh, we're very honored to have published. It's very exciting. So thank you, Jenny, for your input on that. Um, Jenny, go ahead and take it away. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here tonight. I'm going to go ahead and uh, get started. So tonight we're going to be talking about the circular economy. Another term that's frequently used is sustainable materials management. I want to set the context a little bit. So um, municipal solid waste, this is everything that goes to the landfill. Uh, this, these next three slides are from Next Cycle Michigan from uh, RRS in Ann Arbor. In 2018, Michigan disposed of almost 9 million tons of trash in the landfill. Of that, 84% of it is were things that are recoverable. So about 40% were organics and compostables, and just over 45% were some type of recyclable. So this shows us how much useful products we actually throw in the trash and how much opportunity there is for us to change the way we think of materials. Of those almost 9 million tons, 47% uh, of those are residential and 53% are commercial, institutional, or multifamily. Of that 53% that's commercial and institutional, um, the majority of it is generated from retail trade. This ties into your average consumer in the things that we buy. We are retail trade. Um, another high, uh, other high percentages are accommodation and food services and then transportation and warehouse. And transportation and warehouse also falls into um, the goods that we purchase. I'm going to tie circular economy into the city's plans. So the city has the Solid Waste Management Resource Plan, also referred to as the SHWARM. Um, it's a strategic plan of how we are going to handle our waste operationally. It's a very operations-focused plan. It includes year-round compost, 
It includes curbside textile and electronics pickup. And it also includes a plan for construction and demolition debris. When we talk about A20, strategy five is what applies to materials. This has changed the way we use, reuse, and dispose of materials. Those um, first three items are also part of the SHWARM. The fourth one, move toward a circular economy. This is actually written in our plan. That's where I'm going to focus. When we talk about A20, there are three keys to success. There are also keys to success for the circular economy. Um, we're looking at actions, are they equitable? Equity is a very big deal. Are they sustainable actions? And then are they also transformative? We have to make very large gains. And in order to make very large gains, we have to think about how to transform the system. And circular economy and sustainable procurement, and I'm sorry, sustainable purchasing or reducing purchasing are kind of paradigm shifts in our thinking. So what is circular economy? You might be familiar with the term zero waste. Um, they have similar definitions. So when you think about this in simple terms, it means sending nothing to the landfill. But when you start looking, if you go and you look at what zero waste looks uh, means, the definition, it'll talk about reducing what we need, reusing as much as we can, send little to be recycled and compost what we cannot. So the idea is that there's no such thing as waste. We can perpetually reuse resources and not have to throw anything away. And if you think about, um, a lot of this came from nature, like there is no such thing as waste in nature. So that's kind of the premise. Sustainable materials management is a similar term. I'm bringing it up so you can kind of become familiar with other terms that are, are similar. The main difference between circular economy and sustainable materials management is sustainable materials management looks at other aspects as well, like greenhouse gas emissions and other environmental impacts. I am getting a little bit into semantics though. To sum it up, linear economy is this idea on the left here, where we take stuff from nature, we make something, and then we dispose of it. And we do this with energy from fossil fuels. If you went back four generations, this linear economy would not even be in existence. Um, your great grandparents would probably look at you very oddly if you made something and then threw it away. Um, circular economy, on the other hand, is a circle. We talk about reuse, remake, refurbish, and we get these. We do this with energy from renewable resources. So you'll hear that there's a lot of R's in the circular economy. When we talk about resources, this is a, a, a resource hierarchy pyramid, the best uses of resources. So at the very top, the top being the best use of a resource is to remove the need for that resource. So this is things like the Stralis campaign. I'd ask you to raise your hand if you're part of the Stralis campaign, but I can't see any of you. So um, if you are part of the Stralis campaign, you know that it's, I don't use a straw because I don't need one. And so when I go out, I say, please don't give me a straw. So I've removed the need for that resource. Reducing, this is using less of a resource to meet the same need. Um, so a really easy thought here is like printing double-sided. So you're still printing the same amount of text, but you're printing it on half the amount of paper. Resourcing, this is changing the materials or the sources. A really big one here is energy. So this is moving from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Reuse, this is reintroducing into the same flow. So let's say I don't want my cabinet in my house anymore. Instead of throwing it away, I move it into my garage and I repurpose it in my garage. So I'm using it for the same purpose. Then number five is recycle. So there's all these other things that are better than recycling. And when you talk about recycling, it's using a, a material in a different flow. So this could be upcycling when you create more value or downcycling where it creates less value. Recover here, this is where composting comes in. This is capture some value. Um, this is also where waste to energy comes in. I'm not really sure composting, composting comes down here in a resource hierarchy. However, composting has a lot of other benefits as far as greenhouse gases that make it, a make it more beneficial. So one of the big keys here is redesign. We have to 
start thinking about this process at the beginning. So when companies go to manufacture a product, they should be thinking about what's going to happen to it at the end of its life, at the end of its first life. Benefits of a circular economy are many, and these get into a lot of equity issues. So better utilizations of, of resources. This means we have to mine less, we have to go farm less, which um, can be very helpful to communities that are in those areas where it's mined. Uh, creation of less greenhouse gases. This is also an equity issue as we know uh, climate change impacts poor communities more. New job creation, a lot of economic opportunities. This can also be a way to, to raise people up who are, who are under-resourced. So there's a study that estimated there is $4.6 trillion worth of opportunity in the circular economy. So lots and lots of opportunity. Some circular economy terms, refurbish. So that's what these pictures of the chairs are. My son was walking down the street and he saw two chairs like this version on the left at the side of the road. And he sent me a picture and said, would you like these? I said, yes. So he carried them home on his back, like or in his arms like this. And he, I offered to pay him to refurbish these. So he took out all the slats, he sanded them and stained them and then put them back on. And that's the picture you have on the right. So now I have some new chairs that have been, I have some new chairs that have been refurbished. Remanufacture is a very a similar process. Repair, um, if you can repair something, then you don't necessarily have to buy a new thing. Sharing is a very interesting concept. Um, if you think about your car, think about your car or your lawnmower or some other tool that you have and think about how often you use it. So for me, on the high end, I'm gonna say I drive an hour a day. So one hour out of 24 hours in the day, this is about 4% of my day, I drive my car. The rest of the time it sits there and nobody's utilizing it. So that's a really poor use of, that, of those resources. Um, so that's the idea of sharing is that those resources can be used better. So a car, I use a car a lot more than I use my lawnmower, um, than I use my, any of my power tools. So it's good if we could share. Leasing is a similar concept, but the idea with the leasing is that the manufacturer takes it back and has to deal with the product. So they might then be able to refurbish it or remanufacture it or repair it and lease it to somebody else. Maintaining, um, I'm gonna go back to vehicles. If you own a vehicle, you get an oil change regularly. You do that so that the car continues to run. Um, this is also something that applies a lot to heating and cooling systems. Uh, if you own your own house, you probably get your, or you should or could get your uh, heating and your cooling tuned up every spring and fall. This makes it last longer. Um, even if you don't own your own home, you probably have your own refrigerator or freezer. There are coils on these refrigerators and freezers, typically on the bottom or the back, and that's where all the cooling occurs. These coils collect dust and dirt, and then they don't work as well. They're not as efficient. So if you clean those, the, the refrigerator and the freezer become more efficient and they actually last longer. Some tools for going circular, repair shops. There's quite a few repair shops in Ann Arbor, reuse stores, consignment shops, libraries. I believe the Ann Arbor Library also loans out tools and toys, repair cafes and fix-it clinics. If you don't know what a repair cafe, this is an international movement. It's um, a place where volunteers give their time and offer to repair things in the community. Then the community members bring their thing to be repaired and they sit down and have a face-to-face -face conversation with the person who is repairing their, their good. So this can be something as simple as fixing stuffed animals by sewing them up, fixing clothing by sewing, fixing phones, um, fixing appliances. Fix-it clinics are very similar. The main difference with a fix-it clinic is that you bring in the item for repair and the person who has volunteered their time tells you how to repair it and helps you repair it yourself. So these two things are international movements. You can become part of these very easily and they're a way to build resilience um, in the community. There are a lot of online tools as well. 
next door. I um, run a stewardship site and I went on next door and said, hey, I need some, some pots to transfer to give plants away to people. And I had like three responses. Yeah, come get these pots, they're free, you can have them. Um, a buy nothing group, if you're not familiar with this, this is a group that wants to not have to purchase things. So you can offer things up to people and you can also ask for things from the buy nothing group. Um, and the person who offers the material gets to decide who gets that good. Facebook marketplace and supply closets, these are exchange places. You got eBay and Craigslist, also places to exchange and or purchase goods. iFixit, for those who are not familiar with it, is a place where there are tens of thousands of manuals online um, for things like repairing TVs, microwaves. Um, they even have, uh, I guess, directions on how to sew on a button. So that's a resource that you can utilize. So the city is heading in a circular, in a, in a, into a circular economy. Um, these are some examples of things that we do. In parks, we just leave our grass clippings and our leaves on site. This means we don't have to take them anywhere and then put fertilizer to replace those materials that we left. Um, our parks shares equipment between golf courses. Parks also uses the street grindings from our street uh, resurfacing for their cart paths. So then they don't have to purchase different material for the cart paths and that material from the, from the resurfacing doesn't end up in the landfill. Um, the city also has a reuse area for surplus supplies. So if I have a whole bunch of notebooks that I can't use, I take it to the surplus closet and then other people before they purchase things can go and see if there's something that they can use there. The city also has citywide curbside recycling. Uh, a drop-off station and is working to bring a materials recovery facility to the city. This is done in collaboration with Recycle Ann Arbor. Um, Brian Weiner will talk about this. He's from Recycle Ann Arbor. They're a great nonprofit that the city works with. And we also have citywide residential composting. So how can we expand our efforts in the city? So one way we can do this is through legislation. Extended producer responsibility laws. For those of you who don't know what this is, this is a requirement that the manufacturer has to take back the product at its end of life and or responsibly dispose of it. Right to repair laws. For those of you who have a phone, you probably know how hard it is to open it up and try to fix it. Same thing with your TV. Um, the manufacturers do this so you can't fix it. So you have to buy new products. So right to repair laws are making that sort of thing illegal. They also state that um, companies have to provide manuals so people know how to repair these things. Recycled content performance standards. This is things like saying um, the next set of steel we're gonna buy needs to be 10% recovered steel. I'm, I made that up. I don't know if that's the standard, but that's what recycling standards are. Um, bans and taxes on single use items. Uh, quite a few different cities have done this. They've done things like ban plastic bags or put a 5% tax on plastic bags or styrofoam. The state of Michigan cannot do this because there is a ban on this sort of regulation. So if this is something that frustrates you, you might want to work with other citizens to contact your, your state legislators and, legislators and tell them that you want to see this rescinded. Um, Increasing landfill and incineration fees. The state of Michigan has some of the lowest fees in this country. And what this means is it's really cheap to landfill and to incinerate things, which means that things like recycling and circular economy, it's harder for them to make a business case. Policy, this is things that individual companies or organizations can do. Um, we talk about sustainable procurement slash impact procurements. This is putting green policies into your, how you purchase things. Companies, governments, they purchase a lot of goods and we can have influence um, over the economy by requiring those goods to meet certain specifications. Collaboration, the last thing we can do is collaborate. The world is an extremely complicated place and our challenges are very, multifaceted, and in order to meet those challenges, we must work together. Um, by working together, we can help, to, we can begin to understand 
all the nuances of the challenges and how best to design our solutions. Um, Matt Nod will talk about Next Cycle, which is a collaborative effort going on in the state of Michigan. The Michigan Materials Marketplace is a place where you can buy and sell goods. So these are things that you might have a surplus. You can find things on here like pallets, um, uh, cart crates. I suggest you check it out. You can sign up for it. Work with schools to make young people aware of the issues, work with businesses so they understand, and then hold repair cafes and fix it clinics. Last but not least, this is the name of the article that we wrote in collaboration with the Office of Sustainability. And there's a link here to it if you wanna read it when these slides are distributed. And that's all I have, thank you. Yay, thunderous round of applause. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Excellent. Cool, so hopefully you all have a better sense of what, what the waste stream looks like in Ann Arbor and, and the ways that um, you are intrinsically involved with that if you live in Ann Arbor. So up next, um, to give us some perspective on what some of the markets look like um, and much, much more is Matt Nod. So Matthew was the first environmental coordinator for the city of Ann Arbor in 2001 and has 28 years of public sector sustainability, climate adaptation and emergency management consulting experience, as well as four years of academic and industry molecular biology research experience. He has direct experience building sustainability into the culture of an organization and working with um, universities to identify policy relevant data for city planning efforts. He has played a formative and leadership role in several national networks of city sustainability staff, including the Urban Sustainability Directors Network. Matt also has 11 years of environment and emergency management experience with federal and state clients. He was recently appointed to a three-year term on the US EPA Board of Scientific Counselors Sustainable and Healthy Communities Subcommittee. So, Welcome, Matt. Really excited to have you on board here and really excited to hear what, what is happening with Next Cycle Michigan. I think this is really exciting work. So, Matt, go ahead and take it away. Zach, thanks so much. And Jenny, I really, really, really appreciate you teeing this off with words like equity and transformative because it's a lot about what Next Cycle is trying to do here for the state of Michigan. Um, so again, Zach, thanks to you and the Office of Sustainability for having me and great to be here with my previous colleague, Brian. Um, so uh, for folks in the audience, uh, and I, again, really appreciate you being here. I'm gonna share a little bit about a project the state of Michigan is kicking off. And it's really about starting to pay attention to how do we build the end markets for all that material that Ann Arbor has been recycling curbside. And Brian will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think since the late 1970s, 1978, Ann Arbor has been doing this, but a lot of communities still don't. Uh, a lot of townships in Michigan, if you want your trash picked up, you look in the phone book and a private sector company it's a contract with them and they do it. You may or may not get recycling, may or may not get compost. So those of you in the city of Ann Arbor, it's kind of unique that this program's been here for so long. But with these municipal programs that have grown up and we've taught our kids and our grandmothers how to be good recyclers, we haven't really spent the same amount of time building these end markets in Michigan. So I'm gonna play a video and in, in it may be a little soft, so you may need to lean in and I've turned this up as much as I can. Did you know that recycling and recovery jobs could add $9 billion more dollars of labor income into the state of Michigan? Next Cycle Michigan is creating pathways to help make that happen. We have an exciting opportunity for entrepreneurs, businesses, and organizations to get the recycling and recovery projects powered into action. Accepted teams receive technical support from industry experts to refine their concepts prior to the final pitch session. And that's where you come in. As a Next Cycle Michigan ambassador, you can help us recruit participants, engage funders, and spread the word. Be a part of this unique effort to support local businesses, help the environment, and spark economic development in Michigan. Thank you for being a Next Cycle Michigan ambassador. So, 
So that's our introduction to Next Cycle. Um, we want you all to be ambassadors and you can go to nextcyclemichigan.com uh, and figure out ways to do that. But so uh, if you don't know, Resource Recycling Systems is located in Ann Arbor, they're recycle.com. And since I quote retired from the city in 2018, um, I've been consulting and doing most of my work with Resource Recycling Systems. Their uh, home base is Longshore Drive. So if you've ever gone to rent a canoe at Argo, uh, you've driven right past the building, but RRS is probably the largest mission-driven consulting firm focused just on recycling and compost. And so they do a lot of work helping municipalities and states with their programs. So the state of Michigan put out a contract to help build the infrastructure to build this circular economy in Michigan. RS teamed with Centropolis Accelerator at Lawrence Tech and the Michigan Recycling Coalition, which is the NGO that brings together the public and private partners trying to boost recycling across the state. <clears throat> and you're gonna hear some of this more than once. And Jenny touched on this, but we bury 6.8 million tons. And again, take 6.8 million, multiply it by 2000. That gives you pounds. Um, of material that could be recycled. We calculate that if we could keep just 2.7 million tons of that material out, Michigan would be at a 45% diversion rate, which starts to border on res uh, respectable. The other thing we've calculated is if we could put that material to its higher and better use, we'd be $9 billion to the good in labor income. Um, and create over 130,000 jobs in Michigan. So that starts to bump into what uh, we see tourism in Michigan uh, doing for economic uh, development. So this is a cycle that RS uses to focus on. All of this uh, next cycle is paying attention to collection, processing, end markets, education, supporting policies, public-private funding, but NextCycle's really trying to build those end markets, number three, and bringing together public and private funding. There's a billion dollars or more being spent to manage materials, mostly waste in the state of Michigan. And it's not aligned well, it's not efficient. And there's a bunch of structural problems like Jenny mentioned that it's just super cheap to bury trash here. Um, when I used to guest lecture to students at the university, I would say, if it makes economic sense for Toronto to send their trash several hundred miles and cross an international border, there's a problem with the economics. So as a basis for this, RS did a lot of work, very data-driven. What's our current infrastructure look like? Where do we have material um, um, recovery facilities, these recycling sorting facilities Brian's probably going to touch on, they're in the process of rebuilding the one that Ann Arbor's had for many years. Um, so we looked at where there is infrastructure to collect recyclables. Um, right now, we're going to need about almost a million tons a year of uh, recycling capacity. Um, and I think Brian, again, rebuilding the MRF in Ann Arbor, it's about 30,000 tons. So we're going to need about 30 more of those facilities just to manage that new 2.7 million tons I mentioned earlier. Because we've got a significant part of the state that's rural and there's a lot of material out there, we're gonna have to create some alternative non kind of dense urban solutions. So drop off sites, we're working with a bunch of big Michigan um, kind of big box stores that have big parking lots that are thinking about ways they can partner with the state, partner with their local communities, and use those spaces for some of this drop-off and collection. Kind of a hub and spoke system is the design here. So Michigan has done some investment in the past and increased the recycling rate from about 15 to 18%. Um, but Michigan's economy is really positioned for growth. You know, one of the things is we're Michigan and we make a lot of stuff. We just don't make it with as much recycled content as we could. 
And we need to build supply chains. So even if you collect it well, and you're all good recyclers and Brian's group takes it and sorts it, um, we've got to get it from where it's collected and sorted to where it needs to be. And that's a whole other piece of this. So next cycle is about, again, building these end markets. Textiles, growing area where hard to recycle. Some of these have been treated with chemicals and they shouldn't go to certain places. Thin film plastics, there's some uses now for treks and things like that, but most of it's not recyclable in your single stream recycling and how do we fix that? Huge amounts of organic, as Jenny mentioned, going into landfills, creating methane, all of that needs to be kept out and turned into some higher and better use, whether it's, as Jenny said, there's a consumption side, we can just reduce food waste in the first place, but we wanna make sure the organics you have are going in your compost cart as we move to more of a year round collection program in Ann Arbor, but most communities don't have access to that kind of post-consumer food waste. So I look at next cycle as kind of yes and, like we're gonna build this program and there's gonna be huge economic uh, benefits associated with it. We talked about hundreds of thousands of jobs, billions of dollars of labor income, but if we do this right, uh, we can focus on building these new jobs and new companies in hard hit economic areas, Detroit, Flint, Benton Harbor, but also rural parts of Michigan that are really underserved and could use more jobs. Uh, this work has huge climate benefits. We calculate that if we could keep that 2.7 million tons out of the landfill, and again, a lot of this is because there's a lot of food waste that goes there. And whatever somebody tells you, landfills are terrible ways of generating methane. Uh, anaerobic digesters are far better, but we would be 7 million metric tons to the good in carbon if we could keep that material out. And to put that in perspective, carbon footprint citywide in Ann Arbor and in Grand Rapids, by the way, are both about 2 million metric tons. So it's about three and a half times a good sized city in Michigan's carbon footprint every year. Also, energy potential. If we're going to build these new facilities, how do we build them and have them use renewable energy? How do we start moving all the trucks we use to collect this material and the motors that process it um, into electric and renewable energy? So um, now I'll start to ground truth this. So we've uh, been working on this since about October, so it's still relatively new. Um, and I've been spending a lot of time talking to some of our partners across the state and kind of what does next cycle look like? What's it like to build a circular economy? And kind of left to right, Jenny touched on repair centers. Talked to a woman in Grand Rapids interested in kind of helping their underserved community and looking at things like a place you can bring your electronics, furniture, Anything that kind of keeps material out of a landfill fits in our next cycle kind of big tent. Michigan has three of the biggest office furniture manufacturers, Hayworth, Herman Miller, Steelcase. They all have common shipping problems, like things that go on the corners of furniture that get shipped. How do they make them out of recyclable material? Um, and they also have common waste problems, things that um, are organic, but hard to recycle in a traditional compost area and could really use an industrial compost solution. Um, we got a small composter in Grand Rapids that uh, is making an awesome product that the cannabis industry is buying. And he's looking for help for kind of building his business. Um, talk to 10 cities in Western Wayne County that if they all got together and coordinated their contracts, they could probably build their own material recovery facility, kind of like Ann Arbor, or use a model like Lansing's doing where a Canadian woman-owned company is building their MRF uh, with no city investment, just based on the long-term contract. Uh, also talking to brewers, and it turns out hops comes in Mylar bags, and uh, they haven't figured out a scalable solution for that yet. 
<clears throat> so with that, what Michigan's trying to do is um, kind of three sources of funding and support. So if you and I were to start a business in Michigan, MEDC might help us find land, help us find talent. And I think where next cycle complements is how do you, you're a business that wants to use more recycled content, or you've got a great idea to use a hard to recycle material. There's not really a good incubator accelerator space for you in Michigan. Um, and so that's what next cycle is doing is building these spaces. And I'm gonna talk about the six challenge tracks. So that's incubating new companies, new businesses, or existing businesses that wanna grow a new line of business. We've also got a micro grants program. The state's put up about $2.7 million total in new grant money. And about three or 400,000 will go towards small grants, five to $10,000 ideas. You're a small company, you just need a shredder to kind of take something you've got, shred it, get it in a way that you can put it out to that market. And then this Renew Partnership Portal. And the idea there is we've got companies already working in the circular economy here in Michigan. Great Lakes Tissue up in Alpena. Um, they're ready to invest more in their company to make this work, um, but they could use some help because just the economics don't make sense because it's so cheap to landfill stuff here. So that's an area where the state's looking to put up some matching grant money. So they'll be there if and when the private sector is coming with some of their own funding. So this is a highlight of kind of where we are with some of the initial partners. I think there's like 27. And you'll notice that Recycle Ann Arbor is on this list and Washtenaw County is on this list, but also Ice Mountain, Meyer, um, small nonprofits in Detroit, like Make Food Not Waste, Urban Ashes is coming online, but Henry Ford Health System, and then big national groups like the Carton Council, Glass Packaging Institute, those are organizations of the people who make all the cartons, and they really want their stuff recycled, and they're ready to invest millions of dollars in Michigan if they can get the right partners and programs put together. So, to highlight and give some credit to Washtenaw County, um, the county already had some grant money going to support programs that supported their solid waste plan. And the County Board of Public Works just passed a resolution basically saying that any next cycle team that locates in Michigan, they will set aside and make available for application up to $50,000 a year for five years. So they're linking that idea of, we wanna support the solid waste goals of the county, but we also wanna support economic development. And so that's a really exciting kind of best practice from local governments that we're seeing. And so Washtenaw County gets a lot of credit for stepping up early in this. So these are the six challenge tracks that have been identified. Uh, lower left, recycling innovation and technology, those are, that's the area for kind of new cool ideas. Recycling supply chain, we talked about how do you come up with new ideas to get this material from where it's collected to where it needs to be. If the governor ever gets her two to three to four billion dollars she wants to rebuild the roads, lots of opportunities for recycled roof shingles and asphalt and glass in concrete. Concrete, it turns out, is 8% of the world's carbon emissions. So anything you can do to offset the amount of concrete you're using has a huge carbon benefit. Again, micros in the upper right is our small grant program, intergovernmental initiatives, public-private partnerships. That's the innovation space for local governments. And then a challenge track just on organics. So through this, there'll be incubator services, helping new teams with business strategies, new products, customers, strategic partnerships, and where do they get capital uh, to kind of grow these businesses? Everything in Next Cycle is designed to be an investable project. May not make a huge amount of money, but the idea is it's just not losing money. 
So with that, I'm going to jump ahead because Zach, I think I'm getting close. So um, again, with next cycle, we're looking for those new ideas in Michigan. We're looking for funding partners, people out there investing in this space and ambassadors, people to share the stories. And if you've got um, good stories and you know people already working in this circular economy space, I just talked to a guy who makes sustainable clothing and it's based on Jackson Road, Jube. I'll give them a plug, J-O-O-B. Uh, and I think they're gonna have a pop-up store on Main Street. So um, Zach, with that, I think I will stop and give it to Brian. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for enlightening us as to what's happening with innovation right on the forefront in, in Michigan. It's, it's really incredible news to hear about what Next Cycle has available. And I'm excited to see what opportunities arise out of that. Um, Brian, thank you for joining us. Brian uh, Weiner currently serves as the Director of Strategy at Recycle Ann Arbor. Uh, he previously worked for over 20 years at the City of Ann Arbor, retiring as the Solid Waste Coordinator in 2009. He also serves as Chair of the Washtenaw Interfaith Roundtable of Washtenaw County and is the co-founder of the Washtenaw Refugee Welcome. So thanks for joining us, Brian. Um, I will start sharing here for you just a moment. Hey. So uh, uh, thanks to you, Zach, and the city for sponsoring this and for Jenny and, and Matt uh, providing great context for um, uh, my presentation and the, the conversation to follow this evening. Really appreciate it. Um, I, I just the, the, the participation of folks here in the city of Ann Arbor in these forums, um, and what we've seen over time in Ann Arbor really speaks to the power of the grassroots. Um, the recycling movement in Ann Arbor was, has been largely built on uh, grassroots activity over the years. And um, this renewed interest uh, on the part of the citizens of Ann Arbor, as well as the state and county and city of Ann Arbor jumping in uh, are really positive signs that um, we're turning a corner and we're kind of ready to, to move to that next generation. Uh, that Jenny kind of highlighted. Um, so with that, I, uh, a little bit more about myself. I've been at Recycling Arbor now for eight years after retiring from the city uh, in my role and actually started my career at Recycle Ann Arbor as well in 1984, Lord have mercy. Um, so been in the business for a good long time and um, it's been great to kind of bookend my career at Recycle Ann Arbor, you know, the local nonprofit mission-driven uh, zero Waste and Recycling Organization that was founded in 1978. Uh, the very first curbside recycling program in the state, I think fourth in the nation. Um, so really, really pleased with kind of uh, Recycling Arbor's history and, and how we've partnered with the city of Ann Arbor over the years. And just interesting to note that, that uh, um, as I look at, and others as well have looked at successful municipal programs for waste recovery and zero waste, there usually are three components that make those programs successful. One of which is a community advocate, a community advocate uh, activist that's there to, um, to serve as the, as the motivator, as the, as the kind of the grounding in the movement uh, to, to build that grassroots support. And Recycling Arbor has been that over the years. Uh, and so really pleased that uh, uh, Recycling Arbor's presence in this community is, has allowed Ann Arbor to grow in its commitment to recovery and zero waste over the years, but also now having a bigger impact throughout Washtenaw County as well. Just would note, uh, interestingly, I was just thinking today that it was in 1981 that the city of Ann Arbor first provided funding support for the curbside recycling program uh, in Ann Arbor. So we started in 78, uh, went on a volunteer basis for about three years. Uh, and then the city of Ann Arbor started to step up to provide some uh, municipal resources for curbside recycling. So it is 40 years this year that the city of Ann Arbor has uh, supported financially curbside recycling in the community. So kind of a nice uh, milestone. So in addition to that community activist, uh, a stable funding source for programs and services. Ann Arbor is again, very luck 
lucky that we have a dedicated millage for solid waste services that actually has had a pretty healthy uh, balance uh, over the years. Um, still challenged as I think you know most uh, municipal programs and services are, but we are we we are fortunate that we don't have to compete with the general fund for resources, and we have a good pool of money upon which to build programs and services. So you got the activist, you've got the funding sources, and we've got a motivated public. Uh, again, speaking to this group this evening, uh, and over the years, it's been the grassroots that has kind of pushed a recycling and recovery agenda in the community. We've obviously got a, a well-educated population, I think generally really environmentally sensitive uh, uh, population. So we've got the ingredients here in Ann Arbor um, to, to build on the success of the past and to move us to the next level. Um, so that's, a, I think, a hopeful piece. I will not always have hopeful things to say this evening, but there are some hopeful things uh, that I did want to uh, mention up front. Um, moving to the, to the challenge side of things, I also wanted to just be upfront in saying that uh, the impact of stuff, stuff writ large on the health of our climate um, is tremendous. I think we all kind of know that intuitively. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that we are all in some way at various levels uh, addicted to stuff. And um, we all are somewhat complicit in uh, having created the problem and the challenge that we have uh, with um, having hundreds of millions of tons of material uh, to deal with on an annual basis. Um, while I say that, and then just for a little more context, uh, the EPA's life cycle analysis, um, looking at kind of a full circle of the extraction, the manufacture, the distribution, the use, and the disposal of this stuff is responsible for about 42% of our country's greenhouse gas emissions. So if you look at just kind of the tailpipe, the back end, or if you look at just the impact of, of, of uh, emissions and negative externalities from methane generation in landfills, you're seeing only a very small piece of the larger impact that our behavior, our choices have on, on the reality of, of, um, of uh, environmental degradation in our, in our country. Um, and I think it's important for us all to recognize our role in that. If you're a typical American, you're generating about a ton of solid waste every year, a ton a year. Um, and that's just on the back end, that's the tailpipe. That's not looking at all the, the, the waste that's generated in the extraction, the manufacture, distribution, um, transportation, et cetera. Um, so we kind of have a problem uh, on our hands. And while I note our complicity in this, uh, and it's, I think, a moment of, I think, humility for all of us to also recognize the role that the consumer products industry and the packaging industry has also had in uh, kind of creating the problem. And sadly, in the United States, um, those industries have been um, given a pass on having to deal with the negative externalities of uh, what they provide to us uh, and what they help addict us to in the way of consumption, uh, in the way of stuff. And um, that's starting to change. And I think uh, Jenny touched on that a little bit uh, about uh, policy uh, needing to change at, at various levels of, of government in order for kind of, uh, um, you know, kind of long-term systemic change to, to take root. So would note, you know, as individuals, we need to have some humble pie, but we also have to recognize that there are other forces, larger forces at work uh, that have gotten a, a free ride for decades and that have helped to create uh, the, the trouble we're in today. So kind of with that uh, oversight, what I really wanna focus on uh, in my presentation is kind of what services are available in Ann Arbor and Washtenaw County now to increase recovery uh, and to move us toward zero waste. And I'll be focusing primarily on what Recycle Ann Arbor provides and what Washtenaw County provides, but would also note, as Jenny mentioned, that the city of Ann Arbor is responsible for uh, uh, compost collection services and the operation of the compost center. And they do provide um, um, recycling collection services in the commercial sector for larger commercial accounts. 
So the city is also a partner directly in, in providing services as well. I'm gonna highlight on, on what Recycle and Arbor does. Our curbside recycling program, as I mentioned, goes all the way back to 1978. Um, we just got a renewal in the last few months. Uh, we got another five to seven year contract with the city of Ann Arbor through a competitive bid process to provide curbside recycling uh, going forward. So that new contract will begin in July of this year. Uh, so we're very pleased that Recycle Ann Arbor will continue that tradition uh, of providing collection services going forward for the next several years. Um, we collect, um, I think in the neighborhood of 14,000 tons or so a year, uh, 13, 14,000 tons a year. And then uh, uh, the city of Ann Arbor also uh, uh, generates another couple thousand tons a year through the collection programs that it provides. So that's curbside collection. The materials recovery facility, um, I think a lot of you know that, that for many years, uh, Ann Arbor operated its own MRF, as they are called, uh, off of uh, Platte Road, just south of Ellsworth. Uh, that facility was originally built in 1995. So it's so 26 years old this year. Um, got closed for several years because of operational issues with the, the previous uh, operator. Um, the good news is, is that there was, a, again, a competitive bid process and Recycle Ann Arbor was successful in winning the uh, proposal to rebuild the Ann Arbor MRF, uh, which will allow us to have local processing capacity going forward for that base of about 15,000 tons a year uh, from the city of Ann Arbor. And what makes this exciting is not only will we have a local location, but Recycle Ann Arbor is the local uh, environmental nonprofit will also be, you know, managing that, marketing the materials, uh, seeking out highest and best use, using union labor uh, for uh, the services that are provided there, uh, finding local and regional end markets for materials. So we kind of bring a kind of a zero waste mentality to uh, the to, to to the kind of philosophy of how we're looking to operate that facility. We are right now still transferring. Ann Arbor's recyclables to a MRF in Southfield. Uh, and we'll be doing so till about November of this year when the new materials recovery facility will open. There we will be having a grand opening probably in the spring of next year, uh, giving us the time to kind of shake out the facility and hopefully get us past COVID. Uh, so keep your eyes open for uh, grand opening uh, opportunities. And we're hoping that as part of that, there'll be an ongoing educational component to that MRF as well but very exciting. The other good news about our MRF is, as Matt alluded to, is that our facility is intended to be a regional facility. So we'll have capacity for about 30,000 tons a year. So Ann Arbor provides a base of about half the tons, but we will have that additional capacity available to other uh, local communities. In Washtenaw County, institutions, uh, universities like U of M and Eastern uh, and private haulers. So we are, are actively out actually uh, making connections now with all of those other players. Uh, and we are confident that we'll be able to, be able to provide um, competitive pricing to those folks and provide a local alternative. So people don't have to, uh, those entities don't have to drive 20 or 30 miles to the next nearest MRF to drop their materials. They can drop their materials uh, and get back out on the route, uh, saving them money and, and natural resources in the process as well. Before we go to the next slide, uh, Zach, just real quick to note that uh, one of the things on the left side of the, this, this slide is the A to Z guide. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to look at uh, uh, Recycle and Arbor's A to Z guide, I encourage you to do so. It's pretty comprehensive. It's kind of your chance to kind of plug in uh, something you might have and you're not sure whether it's recyclable, um, is it uh, accepted at the drop-off station or at the recovery yard for construction demolition waste? Is it compostable? What do I do with, th with this thing? Is it, is, is it a hazardous waste? Where do I take that? So it just gives you a kind of a quick guide to what you can do with hundreds of different uh, products that kind of enter our lives. So I really encourage you to take advantage of that. The city also provides this uh, as a link on their website as well. So recyclingarbor.org or a2gov.org uh, both provide access to this A to Z guide, which I think could be really helpful for people kind of in the day-to-day -day of what do I do with this? Um, so it helps to eliminate at least some confusion. Uh, so let's go to the next slide if we could, Zach. Uh, the drop-off station is one of the services that actually uh, go back even before predates Recycle and Arbor. The Ecology Center started actually operating the first drop-off center, um, again, it may have been the first in Michigan, 
1971, so it is 50 years uh, this year, um, as an outgrowth of the very first Earth Day uh, and teaching on the environment at U of M in 1970. And one of the outgrowths that has lasted that entire time is a drop-off station service that service, services Ann Arbor and the surrounding area. The drop-off station now is out on Ellsworth Road near Platte Road, kind of in the southeast corner of town. Uh, we're open three days a week. There is a $3 entry fee uh, for folks that are using the drop-off, uh, but that $3 fee gives you access to most of the kind of core recyclables uh, that are accepted at the drop-off, but there are fees associated with recyclables, uh, construction demolition waste, and some materials for disposal that, um, th that there is a net cost to us. That's not much revenue or the revenue from the sale of materials doesn't offset the cost of us processing the materials. So there are some fees that apply, but for most of the it's kind of the right basic, basic recyclables, it is, um, it is included. Uh, which includes actually plastic bags, styrofoam, or a couple of big ones that uh, hardcover books that um, that are free as part of the drop off, along with kind of those uh, items that you would typically include in a curbside program. What makes drop off stations so important as a complement to curbside is that, as you can see from this list, there are an awful lot of materials that are recyclable, but that aren't practical to include as part of a curbside recycling program. And for that reason, um, successful recycling programs really require the need for a drop-off station uh, system as well. And, and Matt touched on the, you know, the need statewide for drop-off stations and to be within a reasonable distance so that it's convenient for people to take advantage of these services. Um, if you haven't been out before, check us out. Um, we are one of the most comprehensive drop-offs in the state of Michigan. And again, just really, really pleased with uh, what we all accept and uh, uh, the amount of use that these, uh, this facility gets. I think we're in the neighborhood of now about 35,000 vehicles that come through the drop-off every year, uh, bringing materials to us. So it's a, it's a great resource in this community. So let's go on then to the next slide, which is a recover what we call our recovery yard. It's our construction and demolition waste facility out on Jackson Road. This is not known by as many people. Um, it's just uh, west of Baker Road uh, in Sio Township. You, it's the old Calvert's facility, if some of you uh, have been around a long time. Uh, Recycling Arbor has um, been operating there uh, for about uh, 12 years or so. Um, uh, open Monday through Friday. Um, as you see the hours listed there. Uh, we do have a small drop-off capability there for some kind of core recyclables, but it is primarily a transfer facility for and recovery facility for construction and demolition waste. And um, what is nice about this is that there are, is no other such facility in Washtenaw County. So folks that are generating, whether householders or contractors, or large institutions that are generating construction and demolition waste, um, short of driving to the landfill themselves, we provide an opportunity for those materials to be dropped uh, locally at a transfer station and avoiding the hassles of going to a landfill uh, with material. We have a, 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 a very rudimentary system for recovery and we really have targeted uh, concrete, uh, again, that Matt had mentioned earlier, wood, metal and cardboard. And it's kind of, uh, uh, an operation we kind of call kick and pick. Uh, so it's no sophisticated equipment. It's just taking a look at what's there in the pile and doing our best to pull out those items. And we get about a 15% recovery rate uh, from that. So again, it's not fantastic, but it's 15% of materials that would otherwise be making their way to the landfill. And we've at least targeted some core uh, materials for recovery out of site. And we provide a convenient alternative for people, again, to have to drive to a more distant landfill for disposal. Um, a piece of really good news is that, is that the city's environmental commission actually has a, a, a team that's looking at a construction demolition waste ordinance uh, for Ann Arbor and, and potentially actually for Washtenaw County that will look at ways to incentivize uh, greater recovery of construction and demolition waste 
uh, that's generated within the community. So they are in the process of exploring uh, what other communities are doing to find, uh, talk to stakeholders locally and come up with some recommendations to ultimately bring to city council. So it's very exciting to see that happening locally. And I know Washington County is very supportive of that effort as well. Uh, and to put it in the context, this is a, a waste stream that people often don't think about, but ends up being um, anywhere from 50 to 100% of the size of the municipal waste stream, the general waste stream, that 280 million roughly tons of, of general waste that's generated uh, in the United States annually. There's a similar quantity of materials that would be considered construction demolition waste. So uh, a very important component. It's not just an, 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 an ancillary uh, piece of the waste stream. It's a, a sizable portion of the waste stream. Uh, and I'm very pleased to see that, uh, that uh, the city of Ann Arbor is, is seriously exploring opportunities for greater recovery uh, in this sector. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, we talked about this uh, uh, some already. Uh, um, Jenny and Matt mentioned this. Um, you know, for many years, uh, over 20 years, Recycle Ann Arbor operated its own reuse center on South Industrial Highway um, in light of COVID. Uh, that was really kind of the final blow for us in not being able to keep the store open. So we were forced to close that uh, uh, um, last year in 2020. However, there are still a number of reuse stores in Ann Arbor and in larger Washtenaw County. Uh, so here's some of those that are listed here. Uh, so if you're not aware of these, please uh, take advantage of it. Um, check out their websites to see what all they take. Different stores have different requirements on what can be dropped off, what kind of things they offer for sale, that sort of thing. Uh, but we do have a vibrant reuse network. So really pleased that that's happening. Um, Recycle and Arbor hasn't dropped its commitment to reuse. We actually have a committee that's now working, uh, looking at uh, other alternatives for reuse, kind of um, building off of what we've done in the past, but kind of before materials reach the tailpipe, kind of the, the back end, we're looking at, at, at opportunities we might have, and Jenny touched on some of those, uh, kind of the upstream opportunities to reduce or eliminate waste uh, at the source or before it's even generated uh, or before it enters the, the waste stream. So we're looking at a, a number of different opportunities uh, as part of that development. So I don't think uh, Recycling Arbor is going away in terms of its commitment to being part of the local reuse network. We're now hoping to kind of supplement the services that are already in place with the, the reuse network that's that's here. So um, if folks are interested in this um, area, please feel free to get in touch with me um, because um, we are early in the process and we really want to explore, uh, you know, kind of better understand what the needs are within the community and how we might be able to respond in a way that provides something creative uh, and impactful here in the community relating to reuse. All right, I'm now gonna, with the next slide, Zach, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's happening in Washtenaw County. Um, again, a lot of people aren't aware that Washtenaw County also has an active role in solid waste management, including planning. And they um, recently went through a couple year solid waste planning process that's actually under the auspices of the state of Michigan and developed a new uh, solid waste plan that had these guiding principles that are actually very similar to the principles that are in the city of Ann Arbor's solid waste plan. So again, we're in a great place in that uh, both units of government, the two, the two largest units of government in the county are, are, are simpatico and are really kind of working together, you know, access and convenience for services, more diversion and recovery, less disposal, education and outreach, data and measurement, uh, ongoing funding support and coordination and collaboration, in this case for Washtenaw County, between communities. And in this regard, I just wanna take a minute to note that Washtenaw County has been successful in creating a new recycling authority here in Washtenaw County uh, that has eight communities. Uh, Ann Arbor just recently uh, voted at Ann Arbor City Council, I think unanimously to join uh, that authority with seven other communities in Eastern Washtenaw County. Uh, which I think now has, I uh, think about, uh, I don't know, 250 
thousand or so uh, um, uh, uh, residents within it. Uh, so a great opportunity to kind of coordinate together. So they're looking at drop-off services, uh, education and outreach coordinated, and potentially um, recycling processing services. So it's possible that ultimately those other authority communities will come on board uh, at the Ann Arbor MRF as well, which would be fantastic. So uh, that authority has just really gotten started in the last year. Washtenaw County was instrumental in creating that authority. So you now for the first time have uh, eight communities that are working together on an ongoing basis to find ways to, to basically achieve these goals that you see listed here and to do so working uh, cooperative, cooperatively with one another. Uh, so next slide. Um, some of the, the, the uh, primary goals is actually to reduce the amount of waste generated within the county. Uh, as you can see there, increase diversion rates, um, develop support and monitor comprehensive education. Uh, can't say enough about the importance of education and outreach. Uh, I think Jenny and Matt would echo uh, with me the importance of that uh, in the community. Uh, Ann Arbor, you know, well-educated community, well-motivated, but one of the huge challenges for us is the annual turnover within the community, certainly the student population, uh, undergrads and graduate students, but also faculty um, and other folks that are associated with the university. Um, we have a much higher turnover rate than a typical community would have and provides an ongoing challenge for us. A lot of international students, uh, folks uh, coming from out of state and out of the country. So a lot of ongoing education that it's really critical for us to, to be successful. So both the county plan and the city plan really put a high emphasis on education and outreach. Uh, ensure the safe, lawful, and efficient management of solid waste. You know, there's still going to be materials that needs to be thrown away. We need to be sure that that is handled um, appropriately. Would note that Washtenaw County, I don't know if folks knew this, there is one active landfill here in Washtenaw County. It's in the northeast corner of the county in Salem Township. It's called the Arbor Hills Landfill. It may be the largest landfill in the state of Michigan. It's, if not, it's in the uh, 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 first two or three largest in the state of Michigan, operated now by GFL. Uh, they just recently took over operation. Um, no one likes to have a, a landfill in their backyard. The, the one uh, 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 positive from that is that uh, that landfill does pay uh, a surcharge uh, to Washtenaw County uh, for us being a, a host, for Washtenaw County being a host for that, for that landfill. And that uh, host fee generates about $1.1 million a year that uh, Washtenaw County is then able to use for a, a variety of programs and services. And if we go to the next slide, I think I can walk you through what those um, services are. And again, I don't know if, if how much people know about these uh, programs, but uh, um, they are wonderful. And we are so fortunate to have the county taking the lead on this. Uh, Home Toxic Center, uh, this is located out on, um, on Zeeb Road, uh, just south of, of Jackson uh, Road. Um, it is open seasonally April through November on Saturdays, uh, uh, I think two or three Saturdays a month. And they do as, also have uh, appointment-based drop-off uh, year round at the Home Toxic Center. So you see over a million pounds a year of hazardous waste uh, ge generated at the residential level uh, come into that site. Um, it is an absolutely wonderful resource. So if you're getting around to finally cleaning out your garage or your basement uh, and you got a lot of stuff that you either accumulated or that was at, you know, uh, belonged to the previous homeowner, this is your place. So go to the Washtenaw County website and take a look uh, because this is an absolutely wonderful opportunity. They recycle uh, some of the materials that come in, I think most of it ends up going to a uh, hazardous waste um, landfill for disposal or high uh, temperature incineration. Uh, so a lot of it still gets thrown away, but it gets thrown away in a way that is safer for the environment. It's not just going into a typical municipal landfill. It's going to a facility that has much stricter environmental standards. Um, so check out the Home Toxic Center uh, that the county operates. They also offer county cleanup days, three or four of these a year at different locations throughout Washtenaw County. Um, 
and you see it's a whole list of materials that are accepted on that day. Just like the Home Toxic Center, these services are free. They do have a, 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 a they do take accept donations, and people are usually pretty good about uh, uh, leaving at least some money behind. I think they get something like 20, 25 percent of the cost covered through donations. So it at least helps to offset the cost. Uh, but there's no charge otherwise for these events. It's kind of just a free will offering, I guess you'd say. Um, and so keep your eyes open for these cleanup days because again, it's a great way to get rid of these. You see the materials are including electronics and tires that can otherwise be expensive to, um, to recycle otherwise. So uh, great service that the county provides there. School recycling program. This has been going on for the last four or five years. Um, Washington County supports uh, educational programs in, uh, uh, and collection programs in about 30 schools in Washtenaw County uh, outside of the Ann Arbor School District. Um, I think there are about 100 public schools altogether in Washtenaw County. So right now they're serving, servicing 30 of them with this program. Hopefully it can expand at some point, uh, but a great opportunity for kids to learn, learn about zero waste and recycling, but to also see it happening in their schools. And I think some of these schools have gotten to 50, 60% waste recovery as a result of these efforts. Uh, um, Washington County also provides grants, uh, $100,000 a year in matching grants uh, for projects that meet the goals of the Washington County plan. This is available to almost anyone, neighborhoods, neighborhood associations, nonprofits, uh, places of worship, uh, for-profit businesses, units of government, um, anyone who has a good idea for ways to reduce waste uh, within their you know, community, however that is defined, or to recover materials is eligible to apply. Uh, they've streamlined the, the application process. So it's pretty simple and straightforward to uh, apply for these grants, what they call sponsorships. Uh, again, a great opportunity if you're involved or you wanna get involved and you just need a little money to get your boss to you know, get off the dime and move something forward, great source of, of uh, funding, again, for kind of small scale projects. Zero Waste Washtenaw is a, a program that uh, Recycle and Arbor had been involved in for a long time with Washtenaw County. Washtenaw County is now leading it, uh, providing um, recycling and composting services at public events in uh, public right of ways. So we do festivals and fairs and exhibitions and that sort of thing. Um, it's, and we work with the vendors in advance of the event so that the packaging that's used at, the, at those events are either compostable or recyclable. Uh, and then uh, um, target a 90% or higher recovery rate at those events. And I've had very, uh, with that kind of advanced planning and the support of the events themselves and then a volunteer-based uh, collection system, um, multiple events in Washington County have now able, been able to achieve a 90 plus percent recovery rate and also to uh, inform the public about these alternatives. Uh, so I think it's been a very successful program. Waste Not is the program that the county has to recognize uh, businesses that are doing meaningful things to recover their waste or reduce the amount of waste that they generate. They also provide some audit and some kind of technical support to businesses to encourage businesses to uh, do the right thing. Uh, so again, if your employer um, is not involved in this program, could be a great way to, again, kind of jumpstart something uh, within your um, situation. And then finally, the medication take back program, as you might imagine, um, flushing uh, pharmaceuticals uh, down the toilet or throwing them in your trash are, are not the best ways to handle those materials can cause some real problems. Uh, and the same with sharps. Um, I'll tell you, in the recycling world, sharps, um, you know, ending up in a recycling container uh, and going over a conveyor belt can be very dangerous to workers. Um, and so keeping them out of the waste stream uh, is very important. So Washington County works with a number of pharmacies uh, and collection points for those materials as well. So it's, I think there's a nice overview of, but I wanted to let you know that there is a lot happening now already. Uh, that can be built upon in the future. And then to just close my presentation, so Zach, thanks for that. I just wanna give you a, a, a quote that maybe goes back to some of the things I said at the beginning of my talk this evening. This is from a gentleman by the name of Gus Spaeth, who is uh, uh, one of the founders of the Natural Resources Defense Council, uh, who was quoted as saying the following, 
I used to think the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that within 30 years of science, we could address these problems, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with those, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. From my perspective, therein lies our challenge. Thank you. Excellent. What a way to end your presentation. That's a, that's a great quote, Brian. Thanks Thank for you. sharing. Um, wonderful. Well, welcome back, all of our panelists. Um, I see that we have had a number of people join. It's wonderful. Thank you for, for taking the time out of your evening to join us. At this point, we'll open it up to um, some q and I know that a number of you have joined us since uh, we began. Um, so I'll just remind you that you can submit some Q&A either via the chat function. There's a Q&A bubble at the bottom of the Zoom screen, there should be. Or you can raise your hand if you would prefer to ask in person. And um, then I can unmute you and you can ask. Um, I, I'm really excited that we have uh, as many of you here as we do. Uh, thanks to joining. I do just want to give a special shout out to a couple of people um, who are, I, I'm honored to have join at an event like this. I think it's really important to have, have you plugged in. Um, and these are council members and Bannister, council member Lisa Dish and a commission member, Stephen Brown. So uh, thanks for being plugged in to what's going on and, and taking the time to come see these, these phenomenal panelists and learn about more about what we're doing with waste. So um, welcome everyone. Um, Let's jump into some of the Q&A that we've received uh, during the presentations, shall we? Um, this first question, um, I think, could either go to Jenny or Matt. Uh, it's about circular economy. Um, and will the city be working with the University of Michigan to make the circular economy come to fruition? I imagine they are the biggest generators of waste, especially when the students leave campus for the summer. So I'll start, maybe Matt can follow up. Definitely, um, U of M has a climate action plan. I'm not sure how that relates to the city's climate action plan. Um, speaking of students, we are collaborating with them right now on a move in, move out waste management program. And that collaboration will continue into the future. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would add is, um, you know, my experience with the city is U of M can be an awesome partner, um, but they're also totally independent from the city. So it, it really depends on where the opportunities are. Uh, the university is a huge consumer, you know, they probably spend $100 million on energy and city of Ann Arbor Municipal Services is about $8 million, So that gives you scale. Um, so I think the way they purchase things, you know, they're already talking about divesting their endowment. Um, so I think they, they can be huge in this space. The one piece I will add is they do a lot of work in uh, new technology and tech transfer. And so we're talking with their tech transfer folks um, because they've got uh, like a group in the global CO2 emission where they're looking at can we sequester carbon and store it in concrete? And are there kind of new technologies that we can reduce the emissions all we want through energy use and it may not, everything I hear is it's not gonna be enough and we're gonna need additional ways to pull out carbon and store it somewhere. So the universities like Michigan are key places to look for that innovation. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that, that partnership between the city and the university is, is an important one to, to examine. And I'll, and I'll just yeah. add, Zach, that um, uh, U of M is planning to issue a, a, a bid document, I think by uh, early summer for the processing of their 
recyclables going forward. And so uh, Recycling Arbor would, would be looking to uh, prepare a, a response to that. So hope, hoping that um, U of M will end up being a partner at the Ann Arbor MRF as well. One of the nice things that that would provide, it would be um, total consistency between the university and the city on the, um, the scope of materials that are accepted in the program. There is an awful lot of confusion right now because U of M's system is different from Ann Arbor's, which is different from Pittsfield Townships, which is different from the city of Ypsilanti's. And so, you know, with people moving through various jurisdictions, including the university, people end up throwing up their hands because I don't know what system it is. I don't know what's in and what's out. Mm -hmm. So one of the nice things that would come from uh, U of M uh, coming to the Ann Arbor MRF would be that uniformity. So hoping that that can, can come to pass. Um, yeah, Brian, oh, go ahead, Matt. Just last thing and just put it in scale. U of M kicks out 7,000 new renters into our off-campus housing every year. So the more U of M can do to teach freshmen how to be good recyclers and being on that same system, like Brian said, kind of how we ever got to this point that U of M and the city of Ann Arbor aren't using those same collection frameworks. It's kind of unthinkable, but we're gonna get back there sooner or later. Um, but it's just a huge effect on our um, on all of that infrastructure. And so the extent we can kind of train students early and then when they come off campus, uh, because then they become residents and then they become Jenny's problem. So, um, you know, the, we could, there are definitely ways we could do better working together. Excellent, uh, thank you all. Brian, there's um, been some uh, concern about the reuse center that closed. And, and I think that a lot of people are really curious to know, um, you know, that that's a big loss that our community has seen um, during this pandemic. And there there's curiosity or speculation about, we'd, we'd like to know if, if there are any plans for that coming back, what the future of the reuse center looks like. Yeah, um, actually our very last day uh, at 2420 South Industrial is today. Um, so actually our, our corporate offices will no longer be at that location either at, uh, at midnight tonight, uh, which includes that reuse center. Uh, what's unfortunate is that it was, uh, it was um, well, well placed geographically to serve the community. Uh, and we also were lucky that we had uh, the Ann Arbor Public Schools uh, thrift store. We had Salvation Army around the corner. So there was kind of a corridor of, of reuse centers in that area. And we did serve uh, um, you know, the entire community, but the low income community, the immigrant community um, were major customers out of that facility. And so it, it was painstaking to let it go. I think we ended up also having to uh, lay off eight employees as a result of that closure. So this has been tough for us. Um, and as I said earlier, really hoping that we will come back um, with something new, a new location, but with a new vision. Um, you know, what is nice about it is it gives us a chance to reboot and rethink what the needs are in the community that might go beyond kind of that traditional reuse. We now seem to have a pretty good network for that kind of traditional reuse. Where, where can Recycle and Arbor take it kind of to the next level? And that's where I think like next cycle resources could be extremely helpful for us uh, in bringing stakeholders together to really identify what the needs are in the community, particularly to serve the low income community uh, with, with the services that we're providing. So don't give up hope. It was a setback, but we are hopeful that we will come back. Great. We gotta maintain hope. Everybody's gotta maintain yes, hope lately. This has been a dire yes. straits lately, um, but thank you. That's good to hear. Um, Matt, this next question, I'm gonna, um, it, direct towards you. It looks like there was some um, interaction on the chat, but I think it's a good question. I wanna make sure it's caught in the recording. And this question is um, in regards to the, the market about waste that you were discussing earlier and how easy it is for us to ship it out because it's so much, uh, so, so cheap for, to do landfills in Michigan. And this question is what's the likelihood of getting those cheap landfill rates increased in Michigan and who decides that? All right, 
full caveat, I'm wearing my own hat and I'm not representing the state of Michigan or resource recycling systems. I'll change my, uh, change my uh, banner. Uh, so uh, what I would say is bad legislators write bad laws. And um, we've had not great legislatures for this kind of stuff. And uh, uh, I was part of the group that worked with Washtenaw County and we weren't going to ban plastic bags. We were just going to put a tax on them, try and make the market work. And, you know, it's just that nudge when you go to the store and like, oh, I got to pay a, a dime or a quarter. And all that money was going to go to environmental education in the county, which really struggles. I mean, Ann Arbor has been good at it for many years. Um, so I guess the short answer is I'm hopeful, you know, that uh, we will recognize that we shouldn't this isn't a space Michigan wants to be a winner in. You know, why should we be the best at burying other people's trash in our beautiful, green, you know, lovely Michigan spaces that sooner or later it's going to contaminate the groundwater nearby? So um, I'm hopeful that, you know, the stars are going to align and there's a whole set of new bills going through the legislature right now. Um, so I think there's an opportunity. Uh, but, you know, it's going to take time because there's a lot of people that, you know, it's going to cost more for the city of Ann Arbor to dispose of trash if those rates go up. Right now, it's, you know, super cheap for us. The good news, as Brian said, is um, the money that we spend on this doesn't compete with cops and firefighters. It doesn't mean that we're going to have to lay off general fund uh, staff. So, um you know, we'll look at what those options are and make choices about where those new programs are. But that's the other reason to be hopeful is Ann Arbor has stable funding that we can start making choices about how to take um, the fund balances we have and make, uh, I would argue, put Ann Arbor back in a leadership position that it hasn't been for a while. Um, there's been some backsliding. So, um, you know, again, super hopeful. Uh, I guess I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thanks, Matt. Uh, big question there. <laughs> um, Jenny, I'm going to direct this next one towards you. Um, considering you have expertise on what is accepted to be recycled in the city, um, particularly, as Brian mentioned a moment ago, it can get really confusing from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, people oftentimes don't know what is recyclable. And so um, evidently there's been some circulation in media lately that makes it sound like only numbers one and two plastics are recyclable in Michigan. Um, and, and as complex and large an issue it is, can you specify whether or not that uh, restriction is in, uh, includes Ann Arbor, or does Ann Arbor recycle more than just one and two? Um, what's the scoop on that? So I really want to punt to Brian because they're the ones doing our recycling. Do you mind, Brian? No, that's fine. Um, actually, uh, one, twos, and fives. Uh, five being polypropylene is also uh, accepted in the program. Those three, uh, PET, HDPE, and polypropylene, are far and in a way the most recyclable with consistent long-term markets um, for plastics. So if you need to buy plastics, those are the grades or the resins that you wanna concentrate on. But even within that, it gets complicated. Uh, the coding system isn't perfect. Uh, even within the, the, the that numeric system, there are kind of subgrades within those, some of which are recyclable, some of which aren't. There are some that are, have multiple uh, resins of plastic and even other materials mixed in together, which makes recycling even more complicated. Um, so it is a huge challenge. And I'll tell you, we still, for those of us who've been in the industry for decades, it is still confounding to us. You know, somebody will show us some new product and we don't know for sure what the state of it is. Um, what, one of the things we're trying to do with the, the new MRF, um, you know, we're touting it as a zero waste MRF, but we also want total um, transparency 
to the public about what truly is recyclable and what's wish cycling. So it may mean, you know, giving a message to the public that may seem like Ann Arbor is actually backsliding when a, in fact, what it is doing is being more clear about what truly is recyclable and what those end markets are and what those products are that are made from, from the plastics that we do accept. Uh, and to be clear about why we're not accepting other types of plastic um, in that mix. So, I, you know, I think the industry has done a great job of, I think, in some ways, um, deceiving people into thinking that plastics are recyclable, when in fact, it's a subset of plastics that are, in fact, recyclable. Uh, and even those, there are better and worse uh, in the mix. I know some, some products consumables, it's almost impossible to buy something that's not packaged in plastic. So I, I, I do appreciate the, 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 the dilemma that we as consumers often um, encounter, but one, twos and fives are safe uh, and, and are as a general rule, again, included in the mix. Use the A to Z guide as another uh, tool. You can always call the city, call Recycling Arbor if you want greater clarification about something as well. Brian, does, is there anything to the shape of the container or the yeah, top? In, yep, in general, uh, for ones and twos, we really are looking at, thanks for mentioning that, uh, something that, that is, a, is a bottle or, or a jug. So that would be kind of the operative uh, kind of visual for what's acceptable in ones and twos. Something that kind of comes to a closure at the top, <laughs> right? Yes. yes. Like this. This is metal though, so I can't, right. can't do that. And, and I think the other caution in, in all of this is, again, for a recycler to be saying this may seem uh, 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 heretical, but when in doubt, leave it out. That I think we've been kind of conditioned and in some ways, you know, with a really good heart to say, well, let me throw it in there. Maybe they can use this. Maybe I'm not sure. I'm going to throw it in and, and hope that it maybe can be recyclable. Well, it ends up more often than not being more of a problem. It becomes a contaminant. It gets mixed with other materials. It degrades the, the quality of the product that we're trying to sell, right, to, to facilities that will turn it into new products. Or it becomes a waste that we have to deal with on the back end, or actually become something that actually can gum up the processing works. Uh, plastic film is a great example of that. Hoses are another great example. The kinds of things that just wrap up into the equipment, shuts down the whole operation for an hour while somebody's got to, you know, we got to turn off all the power. Somebody's got to climb up there and cut this stuff out uh, in order to, to get back up and operating again. So again, people might think, I think this could, is recyclable. Um, and it ends up causing a big problem. So, you know, um, be, be, be careful, be, be, uh, be judicious in the way that you uh, recycle. And again, always feel free to ask too, if, if you have a question about whether or not a product is, is recyclable. I think both the, the city and REA are really gonna try to step it up on, on education and outreach. You know, so, so even for us super recyclers out there to better understand what that universe uh, uh, includes. So we can be responsible about the way that we approach this. Yeah, you said that when in doubt, throw it out at just the right time. We just got a question came in that's asking um, when in doubt, what do we, regarding plastic, what do we do? Throw it away or just recycle it? And there's your answer, say, folks. I, yeah, I'd say Heard it. let it go. I think, um, Jenny, it was a presentation that you were giving um, a probably, it was pre-COVID, so it was over a year ago at this point, where I heard you use the term ref referring to our recycling habits, our collective recycling habits, as optimistic. We're optimistic recyclers. Mm -hmm. We want our ways to, to go to good use, and we want our ways to be recyclable, but unfortunately, it's not always the case. Um, and so, so I think when in doubt, throw it out is a, is a really helpful tool and that I think can help a lot of people discern a little bit more about mm -hmm. what they're doing. Um, I also saw in, in our office, um, in the office space where that I was occupying right before COVID, um, what, those A to Z guys, there are some really helpful guides that you can print off online. And those had just been hung near the trash cans and the recycling bins, um, just as a really quick reference guide. And if you're looking for 
for that in, in your own home or you, you want to do better about recycling, I think that's a really great option. Um, it, it's something that you can print out and you hang it right there and, that, and then it's there whenever you need it. And, 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 and Jennifer, that's available on the city website, right? That kind of one page kind of guide to what's included in curbside? Yeah, we have recycling and composting flyers um, for curbside on the website. A2gov.org slash recycle. There it is. Jenny has a really great presentation that um, a, a nice interactive presentation that helps folks understand um, and think about their, their, their use and their waste. Uh, and if we were, if only we were in person, one of these days we'll be back and we'll be able to see you do that again. Um, but just wanna give you a shout out since we can't do that here. Um, um, there, there was a comment here that I think uh, has a underlying question that I would like to pull out of it anyhow. And that's that um, it, it's acknowledgement that through the work of certain county commissioners, um, the bicycles that are dropped off at the county cleanup days end up getting recycled. Um, they, they end up going to Common Cycle, which is a local bicycle co-op here in Ann Arbor. They're, they're a nonprofit organization that does great work um, to repurpose the bicycles. Um, there are probably additional opportunities of recycling solid waste items um, that, that come in at the county cleanup events or otherwise. So um, maybe um, briefly, what, what are some other things that aren't typically recycled? I'm looking at all three of you here that, that maybe could be recycled uh, or repurposed in a different way. Mm. One of the items that, that comes to mind for me that we get a fair amount of at the drop-off station are uh, um, old lawnmowers. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'd be surprised how many of them still work, but people are just ready to move to the next generation or, or it's not as working as well as they had hoped. Uh, so we do provide those uh, for folks. Um, and I, I'm not sure if we have actually somebody who comes in to repair them or if they're just made available to people uh, and it's just going on the word of the person who dropped it off that it's still operable. But there's an example of something that was brought in that otherwise would just be scrap metal that, uh, again, with just a, a little bit of, uh, uh, of questioning can find out that, in fact, it is still usable and uh, that others can, can take advantage of. So that's just one example. The bikes are another great example. Um, we would often get bikes in at the reuse center that weren't operable, that were damaged in some way, and this group would come in and, and fix those bikes up. And I know they provided uh, many bikes to uh, uh, particularly kids in need and immigrant kids, refugees, that sort of thing. They're just a fantastic service. Hey, Zach, I would add, uh, I guess, two things. I talked to folks in Detroit with the digital inclusion folks. There's a new group coming in called Human IT and they're recycling that e-waste. There was a comment up there uh, and making sure that you know, these digital devices are getting out into communities, especially as Brian said, um, folks who can't just go to the store and buy that new iPad and things like that. Um, and they're also providing not only the equipment but the technical assistance and things like that with you know, how do you get stuff to work on older technology? So really promising program there. Um, and then one thing we really haven't talked about is kind of the new stuff coming down the pike, like EV batteries, solar panels, wind turbine blades. Um, uh, I'm hearing more and more of these smaller lithium ion batteries, the things that run your drill drivers, things like that. People are tossing them in recycling and they happen to start fires that are hard yes. to put out. Yes. Um, so all of a sudden, these MRFs that are taking all your stuff and, you know, it's one thing to recycle the wrong number of plastic. But if you recycle a lithium ion battery, um, things start on fire. And yep. those are millions of dollars of problems. So um, definitely don't recycle that stuff. Um, well, maybe um, on that note, what's a... What's an appropriate means of disposal for a, a dead lithium ion battery? Those are accepted at the, uh, the drop-off station. We don't take uh, 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 alkaline batteries, but we do accept the uh, lithium batteries for recycling. 
So there is an alternative for folks um, at the drop-off station. And boy, Matt is exactly right. Um, batteries are, are probably the single biggest risk. Uh, that and, and uh, propane tanks ending up in uh, recycling containers. Uh, huge problem for MRFs, huge risk. And let me just add there, the small propane containers, we're actually talking, Michigan is talking with U-Haul uh, to create refillable propane containers that people use so mm -hmm. they don't toss them out and recycle them. Um, and I guess this has been very successful in California and especially in partnership with state parks and things like that where people just go buy them and take them camping and then toss them. Uh, and there is a refillable um program you can start it's just again trying to get the right partners together to make it work here in michigan excellent yeah i think it's um it, the the chart of the r's that um that we saw in jenny's presentation i think it is fascinating and, and super helpful uh you know uh, many of us were raised with reduce reuse recycle but uh, that's, it's just important to note that that's a very distilled version of a much broader spectrum of options um, that, that you have before you recycle. Um, so thanks for sharing that, Jenny. Um, we, we still have a few questions to get through. Thank you everyone for, for submitting questions. You still may. Um, we'll just keep chipping away here. I, I do have a question um, for Matt, which is about next cycle and, and the future of, of of this, this economy that, that exists. I mean, it seems like there's a lot of innovation and potential there. Um, considering um, who, who, may, who might be on the line, um, what, what's available for, for passionate individuals? So you mentioned that ambassadorship program. Um, it, it sounds like in some ways, some of that next cycle work is geared towards businesses. Um, but if, if you are just a passionate individual and you want to be an ambassador, what does that sort of look like, or, or what are some options for engagement with Next Cycle? You're on mute, Ben. Thank you. Um, you know, there's all, always opportunities in the way we make choices about what we're buying, you know, talking to the restaurants we frequent and, hey, I'd love that takeout, but I need it in either plastic that's something that Brian can take or is compostable that I send to Ann Arbor's 29 acre combo site. Um, but I also think, you know, we're all, we all work, you know, for a living and then with, what kind of business we're in, uh, if you're buying things, can you buy things with your business that's got more, more recycled content? We need to create a demand for this material. Um, I'll tell you a story. I was talking with a bottler and he buys 80 million pounds of post-consumer recycled plastic. He needs 120 million pounds just to meet his client's demand. In other words, bottlers want more recycled content in their bottles, whether you like bottles or not. Those guys want to put more recycled content there. He can't find it here. He's buying that recycled plastic from California, from Australia. So the idea is like, it's crazy talk that somebody near Michigan isn't buying plastic from Michigan. Um, so I think this is the key part is GM is committed to 50% of their cars being recycled content. Um, so I think those are the kinds of things that as consumers, when you go to the dealer and you're talking to people, we start raising these things and because I think that's how the kind of buzz gets generated and people recognize it. Um, but I think, you know, the way we buy things makes a big difference. And one thing Jenny didn't mention in the laundry list of good things Ann Arbor's done is they've got one of the better green purchasing policies. And there is um, a focus on, you know, uh, asking for recycled content in the things we buy. So. It's something governments can do, it's something U of M can do, but it's also things we can do that, again, as Brian said, if you're gonna buy plastic, uh, buy it with recycled content. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you for that insight. 
Um, I think we'll we'll take time for just a couple more questions here. Um, there, there's a good question here about cooperating with Ann Arbor Public Schools. Uh, you know, I just mentioned a moment ago what what we many of us were taught when we were young, which is the reduce, reuse, recycle, and that, as as we've just demonstrated, is is just a, a small snippet of a, of the larger process. And so, what are some ways that we have been the city has been cooperating with Ann Arbor Public Schools to help educate students about zero waste goals and about that broader spectrum of the R's, the seven R's that, that are really involved in that. So I don't have a lot of knowledge about this. I do know we partner with the Ecology Center to do uh, outreach in public schools. I don't know if Brian or Matt know anything more about that. Yeah, we, uh, uh, that is the case, and I think that was that contract was fairly recently renewed, um, and I think it's for something like 200 presentations a year in the Ann Arbor Public Schools uh, to you know individual classrooms. Uh, so that's pretty vibrant, and then the city also does provide collection services. I think at most of the public schools for recyclables. Uh, there's some talk about the need for uh, incentivizing the public schools to engage in either on site or uh, city provided compost services, including potentially food waste recovery. I think there's a lot of interest in the, in the public schools in um, kind of adding that to its portfolio of recovery. So I think there could be some great opportunities there. Uh, the other thing worth noting is that for, boy, about 20 years or so uh, before the Ann Arbor MRF was shut down, there, there was, and there still is an education center at the materials recovery facility. And we had thousands of school kids it actually was built into the curriculum. I can't remember what grade it was, but every child in sixth, sixth grade would come through the Ann Arbor Murph as well as some of the other city facilities uh, as part of a learning tour. And so we're hoping to reactivate that as, as we reopen the Ann Arbor Murph uh, down the road as well. And that point I think was worth its weight in gold in providing uh, a direct experience of the recycling process to kids. Um, Boy, I tell you, you want smells? We got smells. <laughs> you know, you <laughs> you want sounds? You know, we got equipment beeping and machines operating. Um, so it provides a great hands-on opportunity as well. So I think that's another great opportunity for us, uh, for the city, to connect with the public schools. Thank you. Um, we we've got a, a comment that. Um, that just wants to encourage folks to purchase bags, uh, reusable bags at grocery stores. Um, there, some grocery stores do have options available uh, that are inexpensive. Um, just there's a lot. I think it's 500 billion plastic bags a year. Something absurdly huge uh, are used in the United States. And so, yeah, anything that we can do to reduce that. And similarly, um, I, this is kind of a broader question about uh, how to nurture a truly circular economy in the products that we regularly buy. There are a lot of things that, that we use often, shampoos, soaps, um, certain food items uh, we're, we're consistently buying that come in some sort of packaging. And so when we're looking at transitioning to a, a true circular economy, what, is the, what are some of the challenges that we, we face logistically or otherwise that um, that prevent us from reusing glass bottles and jars or, or stainless steel um, like other countries do. Uh, why why hasn't that been been more adopted? Is it something about the the labels and the stickers and the glues that are causing an issue? Um, why can't why hasn't that been more widely adopted in the United States? I'm going to be a little cynical and I'm going to say it's due to big companies. <laughs> waste companies, uh, marketing, uh, you know, goods companies, it, it's totally doable. I mean, I remember as a kid growing up, Town Club and Fago pop in, in uh, reusable glass. Uh, that was 50 years ago, the technology existed to be able to clean and repurpose those glass bottles for use again. What we've gone back and, you know, we're, we're now unable to technically deal with this material. I think it does come down to uh, our obsession with convenience and um, and the marketing ploys of of big companies that 
uh, have moved us away from that that ethic uh, and that burden. You know, yeah, it's an extra step for them. But you know, once you've built it into the into your infrastructure, boy, the the benefit to the larger society is so much greater than single use products. So the, I also want to put out there that waste companies are big business and they have a lot of lobbying power and they benefit from people throwing their stuff away and or even recycling it. Reuse is not part of their model. Um, so there are some companies out there who are working on this in the United States. Closed Loop does this. They, they do returnable containers. Some other things you can do yourself is go to bulk food stores. There's a couple in Ann Arbor. Well, there's a brand new one that I'm hearing about opening up on Liberty where you can go refill your bottles of, and I haven't been there, so I can't give them a plug other than it's a great idea that you go in and kind of fill your container with whatever you need and, you know, kind of, but I think that gets it back to this idea, like as Brian was saying, you know, um, we're not shopping local as much as we used to, you know, right. where you'd kind of bring your bottles back to your brewer and bring your bottles back to the people refilling your soaps and stuff like that. And, you know, I think that is a key part of this. Um, it's easy and cheap, you know, and, and that's the other thing is it is so cheap to bury stuff in Michigan. Yep. We're not even starting to send yep. the right market signals uh, and this expectation that recycling should be free, you know, because trash is free, you know, it's just so cheap to bury stuff. Um, these things all have real costs and it's been made artificially low. And so it's gonna be a challenge as we kind of bring the true cost of this back to the public. Yep. So what I'm hearing um, <laughs> is in some form is a call to action to anyone watching or, or participating tonight um, and, and abroad to be engaged with your political system, to contact your state legislatures, legislators and, and encourage them to take this more seriously and, and, and move policy forward that can really have meaningful impacts on, on the rates for landfills, et cetera. Um, I, I, would, I would also say, Zach, that reaching out to businesses makes a difference as well. Yeah, put, put pressure on the businesses that you already frequent to do the right thing or keep doing the right thing if they're doing something good. Um, you know, and that's where, you know, the local probably has your voice as a bigger impact is to put the pressure on our, our local infrastructure to step up and, and, and reflect the values of the larger community and the choices that, uh, these businesses are making. Yeah. Thank you, Jenny and Brian for that, that putting pressure on businesses, I think does make a, uh, a big impact. Um, there are a few out there that are exploring doing um, doing an exchange program with their their product containers. Um, you know, I'm not going to say any names, but I, I know that TerraCycle is a company that is working to to organize a lot of this um, with with large um, product companies. So, um, fingers yeah, crossed that that continues Loop. to develop. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. That one's called Loop. Loop. O P. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, Brian, just a quick question about electronics. What, what happens to electronics when they're dropped off at the center? Um, are they disassembled locally? They're uh, as, as advanced computer recycling and IPSI claims to do, um, or are these devices typically sent overseas? Yeah, we uh, have worked with various vendors over the years. I think right now we're sending our electronics from the drop-off station to Padnos, I think in Kalamazoo. Uh, and I think they do some disassembly there and then market components. Um, we vet uh, and have over the years vetted every, actually every vendor that we sell product to. Uh, we visit the site if at all possible and do research to verify what the, their end markets are. And in the case of electronics, I, I don't remember the, the, the name of the certification, Matt, if you remember, but there is a certification or a couple different certifications for these electronics companies. Uh, and Padnos, in, in this case, does meet those requirements. So you basically have an, an agent that is vetting these uh, companies as well that serve as another uh, protection that, that, that they're being responsibly uh, processed. Matt, right. do you recall what that's called? I don't, but I'm going to toss in one thing real quick. Uh, 
I hear from a lot of people that, well, you know, uh, the market went upside down in recycling and I'm hearing that other communities aren't recycling. So everything that I'm recycling is getting landfilled. And that is true in some communities, is not true in Ann Arbor. And I just no. want to reassure people that your stuff is getting recycled to the ex best extent that Recycle Ann Arbor can make a market. And it's the other reason why working with a group that's not making a profit makes a difference because they're really mission driven and focused on recycling. Yeah. Give you an example. There's a city in Southeast Michigan that had a recycling contract with a vendor to pick up all their recycling. It did not say in the contract that the recycled material they were picking up had to actually be recycled. So when the market did go upside down, this private company told the city, we're going to landfill your recycling because we're not required to actually recycle it. And that's what happened for a while until they could kind of cut that contract, get someone else. So while the market has been turned upside down, um, your stuff in Ann Arbor has been recycled. Yep. And so I think you can be reassured that we can all do a better job, like putting the right stuff in the in our single stream. Mm -hmm. But um, trust that it is getting recycled, even if it means that RAA is sending your glass to Ohio, because that's a place that will actually recycle the glass. Yep. Michigan doesn't have a good market for recycling. Grand Rapids sends its glass to Chicago. It's one of the things Next Cycle's trying to do is bring that glass end market to Michigan so we st start creating ways to manage that material and putting people to work in Michigan to do it. Yep. Well, on that note, um, I want to thank everyone who has submitted questions. Um, I think that we've had some really excellent conversation. Um, and I'm going to ask each of you to just leave us with a thought uh, you know, we've had some really good conversations. What is something that you are most looking forward to when it comes to waste reduction or circular economy that you think that you see on the horizon, either in Ann Arbor or globally, um, that that you're you're most excited about? Uh, I can jump in. I think uh, this idea of ext uh, extended producer responsibility. There is a growing movement uh, in in uh, multiple states. Uh, and, and actually in, in multiple countries now throughout the world to hold the producers uh, of these products and packaging to account and that they have to step up and bear the cost uh, for disposal and to set standards for recyclability uh, in the products that they're making. So it's, you know, it's like, it's time for you folks to grow up and take responsibility uh, or your share of responsibility and not just voice that burden on us as the public or on local units of government to bear the entire cost of kind of a problem that you've had a big part in creating. So to me, I'm really encouraged that there, and even at the national level, I think there's been legislation now proposed, whether or not it can make it through uh, uh, the national system or not, we'll see. But the fact that it's even being discussed is a, is a really positive step forward. Thank you. Oh, Jenny. I'll go, I, I just wanna say, right now in general is a time of great change for the planet. And with that time of great change, there's a lot of opportunity for things to, ch for things to transform and for us to do things differently. And that excites me in general. Um, on a more humble note, I think the repair cafes and the iFixit clinics are awesome. <laughs> and I would love to see a bunch of those going on in the city as a way to build resilience and just reusing materials. Yeah, I'm looking forward to like new jobs in Michigan using this recycled material and solving for climate change and putting people that are hard to employ back to work. So um, I think this is one of those, we need to recognize all the co-benefits associated with all the good work that Jenny and Brian and others are doing um, and uh, just put the package together and make it work here. Couldn't have said any of those better myself. So thank you all so much for attending. Huge thank you to our panelists for coming and sharing your knowledge and your expertise with us. Um, I think we've had some wonderful conversation and I'm looking forward to what's coming in Ann Arbor. So 
Thank you all and have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Bye y'all. Bye. Bye.